Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bahram Beyzai, and I teach here in the Iranian Studies program. Uh, Dr. Milani asked me uh, to read this message from him. First and foremost, I apologize for my absence, and an urgent matter made it impossible for me to be here and to introduce our esteemed guest tonight. In the modern history of Shiism, uh, there have been those critics and theologians who have tried to find a reading of Shiism that is compatible uh, with modernity and democracy, and those who have seen democracy and all that is modern a serious threat to Islam. Mr. Kadivar is one of the most prolific writers and scholars of the first group. His training and experience in semi uh, seminaries combined with his willingness uh, to challenge received opinions, his reading, uh, readiness to accept a life of exile uh, rather than submit to the dictates of despotism, have turned him into one of the uh, refreshing voices that offer an alternative to the reality of ruling clerics in Iran and to the violent face of radical Islam as evident in forces like ISIS. His most recent writings offering a serious critic of the theory of Velayat Faqih, no less than his statement, along with three other Islamic scholars opposing the tragic acid attacks on women and his belief that women must be free to choose their own attire, are examples of his dynamic intellectual journey. I won't repeat his impressive resume uh, as it is available uh, on our website. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Mohsen Kadibar. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and pleasure uh, to be in Stanford University, maybe for the second or the third time. I thank Dr. Bezai and Dr. Milani for having me here. So, uh, I published an e-book a few months ago. You can see the cover of that book in the name of impeaching Iran's supreme leader in his religious authority. I try to give you a brief report of that book. I could not publish that, that book and my other books in Iran, and after publishing, posting it on my website, I have a new restrictions and censorship from the Iranian regime. The complexity of the leadership of Islamic Republic of Iran. Also, my presentation is complex too, I try to make it a little bit easier by this PowerPoint. Also, all the points will be not appear in the PowerPoint, but I try to explain something more. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, called himself as caliph or commanders of believers, Amir al muminin in a mosque in Iraq in July 2014. The office of leader of Iran calls himself the guardianship of Muslims, Wali Amr al-Muslimin, or the supreme leader. His followers think that he is the real and unique imam of the Muslims and commander of the believers, Imam al-Muslimin and Amir al-Mu'minin. Also, there are a lot of ambiguities in the term of caliph, imam, guardianship of Muslims, or commander of believers, but at least one point is clear. 
All of these titles are religious, related to the head of Ummah or Muslim community that is used for the first authority in theocracy or Islamic state in the past. And they try to use it in the modern time. The Sunnis use Caliph and the Shiites, Muslims, use Imam or Wali or Amr or the guardianship of the Muslims. But no difference in the fact. Also, they use different titles. There are two titles for a spiritual leader and political ruler of Islamic theocracy. Both Sunnis and Shiites seek to find the archetype of their theocracy in early Islam. Sunnis in first three righteous caliphs and Shiites in the first three Imams, as well as profit for both. The original duties of the leader are three. Leader of theocratic state. First, protecting the Islam and Muslim community through power. Second, implementation of Sharia. Third, expanding Islam in the world. There are the three major duties of the head of Islamic theocracy, and regardless of the name, Imam or Caliph, or guardianship of the Jews. All the administrative duties of the president or the prime minister in the modern states are the secondary duties of the leader of Islamic theocracy. The president is the exec executive deputy of the leader, nothing else. He is not the first job in the theocratic state. <clears throat> there are a lot of complexities in the leadership of Islamic Republic of Iran. I briefly mention a few points, maybe three or four points because of the my short time. The first point. The first question about leader of Iran is on the domain of his leadership. Is he A, leader of Iran, B, or leader of all Shiite Muslims, C, leader of the whole Ummah or all Muslims? His claim his expectation and his desire, as well as his advocators, is the third. Means the leader of the whole Ummah, all Muslims in the world. Or at least the second, the leader of all Shiite Muslims. But all the members of the Assembly of Experts, Majlis al Khubara or Majlis al Khubraga, that is responsible to select or discover the leader are Iranian. I use two terms, to select or to discover. Because the conservative Muslims believe that they do not elect, they do not select, they discover. They discover the willing of God. Maybe something, let, something that happened in Vatican. So all of the members of this assembly are Iranian. There is no any representative from non-Iranian Shiite, not from Iraq, not from Lebanon, not from Bahrain, not from other, other countries. Or non-Iranian Sunnis in this assembly, in this supreme assembly. How can they choose the leader of all Muslims? Although Iranian constitution did not use the term supreme leader and confined the leader of Islamic Republic of Iran as a leader, not supreme leader, but did not require the nationality of the leader to be Iranian. While the president of Iran 
should be Iranian and should have Iranian origin too. There is no legal obstacle for a non-Iranian Shiite to be selected as a leader of Islamic Republic of Iran, according to Iranian constitution. It's my first point. Second point. The second question is also on the domain of his leadership, but from another perspective. Is he temporal ruler, B, a spiritual leader, C, both? Iranian constitution implicitly defined him as temporal ruler, nothing more. But the claim and expectation of the founder of Islamic Republic of Iran, Mr. Khomeini, and his successor, Mr. Khamenei, is both temporal ruler and a spiritual leader. Is the leader of this world and also religion. It is interesting that the guardianship council, Shurai Negahba, that works as an Iranian Supreme Court and is responsible for monitoring the bills of the parliaments to be in consistency with the constitution, frankly expressed that the constitution is the minimum or the floor of the duties of the supreme leader and does not limit his duties. In contrast, his authority is absolute according to Sharia. All the constitutions restrict and limit the responsibilities or of all of all officials but they believe and their job is protecting the constitution and they interpret the constitution in this way what we have in the name of duties of the leader in the constitution is the minimum of his duties he has a lot of other duties that is not mentioned in the constitution. Where should we find those duties? You should refer to Sharia, not to the constitution. The head of judiciary powers expressed the same opinion. This head of judiciary power and the former head of judiciary power. According to this approach, that is dominated in Islamic Republic of Iran among the court clerics, the constitution is not the ultimate judge in domestic conflict. So it's so important for understanding what is happening in Iran. The constitution is not ultimate judge in domestic conflict. They can refer to it to international, in international conflict, but not in domestic conflicts. Sharia is that ultimate judge. There is an article in the Constitution that somehow justifies this interpretation, Article 4 of Iranian Constitution. So, if you accept this practical viewpoint, Sharia is the realm of diversity. Jurists have different and sometimes opposite opinions and fatwas. Which of these opinions and fatwas should be grassroots of the Islamic Republic of Iran? The officials response is the opinions and the fatwas of the leader, no one else. So it means implicitly that the leader should be religious authority and should have written and published opinions in demonstrative books of jurisprudence and booklet of fatwa. As Ayatollah Khomeini had this background. He had written fatwas and he published them before coming to the office. So 
there is a question. Is there any room for the other religious authorities that is called maraj or taqlid? Is there any room for them in Islamic theocracy? Yes and no. Theoretically, in private affairs, they are free. They can express their opinions, their fatwas. But in public affairs, the officials refer only to the opinion and fatwa of the leader, no one else. Practically, competition with the leader is not easy. Islamic theocracy is the monopoly of the opinion of the leader and the other religious authorities would be under pressure and restrictions. Tolerance with the jurists that have large supporters among believers has been rare. The case of Ayatollah Shariat Madari, in the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, and the case of Ayatollah Muntaziri, in the case of Mr. Khamenei, are clear examples of intolerance of Islamic theocracy in the case of clerics. For explanation of the third point, I need a little bit classification of the Shiite clerics. Before bringing up the third challenging point, it is necessary to clarify the cleric rankings in Shiite tradition. This hierarchy is practical, but theoretically is not so clear. It was not written in any book. We have at least four ranking among Shiite clerics. And understanding of the differences between these four rankings is necessary for understanding the third point of my presentation. The first ranking. The first ranking Shiite clerics are called Grand Ayatollahs. Ayatollah al Uzma. There are Shiite authorities. When in this paper I use Shiite authorities, I mean the first ranking of Shiite clerics. There are at least five conditions to be the first ranking of Shiite clerics. If a person, if a cleric, have all of these five conditions, he will be the first ranking, in the first ranking. Condition number one. They are qualified by their masters, by a written certificate of ijtihad. Ijtihad means independent reasoning. They have certificate of this kind of ijtihad. It's something like, for example, postdoc in the modern academy. Second. They had experience of more than two decades teaching in advanced level of seminary in jurisprudence and its method. In Shiite seminary, we, had, we have three levels. And the advanced level, they call it kharaj, that means out of the text. And the master explain his research for his students. It was not written in any books. So it should have, he should have at least two decades experience of teaching in this level. If he did not teach, he could not be in the first level. And two subjects are necessary, jurisprudence or fiqh or sharia, and the second, the method of jurisprudence, that they call it usul al-fiqh. Methodology of jurisprudence. So they are well known as jurists in the seminaries. No one can claim I am a jurist. He should teach, and by his teaching, the teaching also is open for anyone. Anyone can come to his class and testify his knowledge. 
The third condition, they publish the product of their teaching and research in several volumes of demonstrative books of jurisprudence, its method, and relative sciences. Each of these first ranking, they have several volumes of book that most of them, almost all of them, were written in Arabic, dark demonstrative, full of arguments, and anyone can read them and check the knowledge of the author. No one can claim, I am Grand Ayatollah, and he did not write anything. He did not publish anything. <laughs> the fourth condition. They publish a booklet of their fatwas as Persian independent book or as an Arabic footnotes on the famous booklet of Urbatul Wusqa. So, the fourth condition, they have a booklet, is the summary of their demonstrative book, about 200, 300 pages. They are outline of their works in Persian or in Arabic. Also, it's open to the public. And it's footnote on a very a specific book that was written about one century ago, each jurist should write his opinion at the footnote of this book. And you can compare the footnote with the text and know the knowledge of this person. It's the fourth condition. The fifth one, a large amount of believers trust them. Several millions should trust them if they want to call themselves. We are in the first ranking of Shiite authorities. A lot of people should trust them. Follow them in their religious affairs. Because of it, they are called source of imitation. Marja o taqli, source of imitation. Means the others, the believers, at least Shiites, follow them. And pay their religious tax to them means charity, zakat, or homes. So also they are financial source in addition to source of knowledge. How many people we have in the first ranking of Shiite clerics, for example, at this time, by these five conditions? There are less than 20 in Najaf and Qum, in all Shiite com communities. There is no centrality. They are almost more than, how old are they? They are almost more, more than 75 years old. The average of their age is about 85 or more. We call, the Shi we call them Shiite authorities. There is no centrality in Shiite Islam, such as Catholicism. So the position of major Shiite authorities is something like the position of Pope in Vatican. Not one Pope, we have about, in each time, about 20 Popes. It's about the, the first ranking of Shiite clerics. <clears throat> the second, the second ranking. Shiite clerics are those who are mujtahids. It means they have certificate of ijtihad, independent reasoning. Among the Shiites, they are called Ayatollah. The first ranking, they were called Ayatollah al-Uzma, means the Grand Ayatollah. The second ranking, they are called Ayatollah. They are somehow like the cardinals in Catholic Church means in the second level. And also they have some conditions. Condition one, that the certificate of ijtihad, the same as the first ranking. Second, they have the experience of teaching in advanced level of seminary, but not, for example, several decades. Third, they may write some books on demonstrative jurisprudence and its method. Fourth, but they did not publish booklet of fatwa. Five, they are not the source of payment of religious charity. They are not finance source. They are not also the source of imitation of the people, of the believers. 
six, they have the potentiality and ability to be the religious authority in future, but they are not now in this time. The number of these second ranking is almost 300 in the Shiite community, not only in Iran. The third ranking. The third ranking of Shiite clerics, we can call them partial mujtahid, not absolute mujtahid. I'm sorry, that's a little bit complicated. I try to make it easy to the public. They are called Hujjatul Islam wal Muslimin. We use it in Iran and also in other Shiite countries. They are somehow like bishops in Catholic Church, somehow not the same. The condition of this third ranking is also they may be graduated, but their researches have not been completed in all parts of jurisprudence. They maybe we can cause an incomplete research. They are not like the first and the second complete researcher. They do not have the certificate of ijtihad, and they have not permission to issue fatwa. A couple of thousands of these third ranking could be found in Shiite communities. And the fourth and the last ranking. They are called Hujjatul Islam without anything else. They are not mujtahid. They are a student of advanced level of seminary or researchers. They are not qualified for any religious advanced job. They are allowed to be preacher or Imam of the small mosque. There are almost 30,000 people in Shiite communities. So, after understanding this introduction, now is the time to explain the third point that is my major point in this presentation. No, it's the time to explain the third challenging point on leadership on Islamic theocracy. And it is required religious minimum condition. Which of these four ranking is necessary for the leader of Islamic theocracy? Is the major question. Which of these four ranking that we learned? There is no one question. Evolution of answers happened in Iran. And I try to review the answers in these 35, 36 years. The experience of Iran is interesting in this case. He was supposed to be not only Grand Ayatollah, but also the most learned Shiite authorities, al marja al azam So the first approach, as you see here, he should be the most learned among the first ranking Shiite authorities. It's the condition of ideal leader of this Islamic theocracy. It was justified that the leader is firstly the leader of religious affairs and secondly the leader of temporal affairs. He needs the highest qualification in Sharia. Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of Islamic Republic of Iran, according to his followers, was the most learned Shiite authorities in his time. But what happened after him? <coughs> it's our story today. Ayatollah Khomeini was more than 80, and he was ill in early 1980s. More than 80, and he was ill. His competitor, Ayatollah Shariat Madari, was host arrested under suspicion of a coup d'etat. Ayatollah Muntazari, the most distinguished student of Ayatollah Khomeini, was introduced as Shiite authority, means in the first ranking, by support of the state in 1984. The majority of the members of the Assembly of Experts elected Muntazari as the successor of Khomeini in 1986. After
after a deep challenge between Khomeini and Montazeri on some vital administrative issue such as human rights and tolerance, Khomeini fired his successor two months before his death. It was a surgery in the history of Islamic Republic of Iran. In contrary to state reports, Khomeini did not appoint anyone as his successor. He did not appoint anyone. Shiite faith did not allow him to do so. It's not a kingdom. A couple months, bef couple months before his death, Ayatollah Khomeini appointed a committee for preparing amendment of Iranian constitution and wrote in his official letter to Meshkini, the head of this committee, quotation, it's not required for the leader to be Shiite authority. In parentheses, means it should not be required to be in the first ranking. Rather, it's accepted if he has the potentiality to be religious authority. It means it's possible for the leader to be in the second ranking, not in the first ranking. It means that the leader of theocracy does not need to be neither the most learned nor the first ranking of Shiite clerics. He declared that the second ranking clerics, Mushtahid, but not Marja, not the source of imitation, were qualified to be the leader. Indeed, he confessed that the role of jurisprudence in the guardianship of jurists, Milayatul Faqih, was not so high. He highlighted the role of administration and political experience and knowledge. It's first step of going toward secularism. The assembly of experts in its first meeting immediately after death of Ayatollah Khomeini elected Mr. Khomeini as the leader of Islamic Republic of Iran. He was the third ranking cleric on that time. I mean that he was neither first ranking, not Shiite authority, nor second ranking, absolute mushtahid, but not marja. He did not have any certificate of ijtihad from none of his masters, including Ayatollah Khomeini. He did not have. He did not write and did not publish any demonstrative books on jurisprudence and its method. Not in fiqh and sharia, not in usul al fiqh. He did not teach any courses in advanced level in seminary. According to Iranian constitution of 1979, that was legal scale of that time, the required condition of the leadership was being Shiite authority, means first ranking. The assembly of experts did not vote to any of Shiite authorities of that time. And among them, there was Ayatollah Gulpai Ghani and Ayatollah Muntazri. They did not vote to them, only a minority. They did not find any clerics among the second ranking, means Mujtahid, that qualified in administration and political experience. It means that the Khomeini's declaration on reduction of the required condition of the leader from the first ranking to the second ranking did not work on that time. The assembly reduced the required condition of the leader one step more. If the leader had general knowledge in jurisprudence, means partial mujtahid, not absolute mujtahid, it's fine. Rather, the necessary condition is good administration and rich political experience, such as presidency. The assembly of experts protorized politics to religion, or pol political experience to caloric ranking. It is a very pragmatic and meaningful decision. They guarantee the continuity of Islamic Republic of Iran 
as a political regime. On the other hand, they went far from the guardianship of jurists, Velayatul Faqih, the theory of Ayatollah Khomeini. They gave the large power of the first ranking Shiite authorities to a third ranking cleric. It is a breakup of the theory of guardianship of the jurist. It is more than evolution of theocracy to autocracy. So, now it's the time of the fourth point. It's, what, it's not the last step of evolution of the leadership. The assembly of experts promoted Mr. Khamenei to the second ranking. His religious title was changed at one night from Hujjatul Islam wal Muslimi to Ayatollah. But he understood that without carrying the title of the first ranking, means the Grand Ayatollah, and becoming Shiite authority, Mirza Taqlid, he would not be able to continue his leadership. He started to collect religious tax in late 1989 and began teaching in advanced level of jurisprudence since 1990. While he did not teach the advanced level of method of jurisprudence, teaching jurisprudence without lack of teaching its method. His students are court clerics, those who have governmental jobs. Although the, instruc the instructions of home seminary, Jamaatul Mudarrasin, uh, or other instructions, post their audio recorded classes on their website, none of the audio records of the class of the leader were published yet. The only product of the research of demonstrative jurisprudence of the leader until this time are two articles. He did not publish any book in this issue yet. In 1992, his first short booklet of fatwa was published in Beirut, about 120 pages. The fatwas were response to the questions of the believers. Most of the responses were references to the fatwas of Ayatollah Khomeini. It was not the fatwa of himself. A few of them were wrong. I analyzed these fatwas in the book. Qualifications for leadership, I mean being among the second ranking clerics by seven members of assembly of experts were translated to Arabic and put as the qualification of the first ranking clerics in the introduction of this booklet. It was a misrepresentation and deceit. They wrote some certificate for him that you are qualified to be the leader, means to be the second ranking. And he put them in the introduction of the book of fatwa as the qualification for the first ranking. The association of the instructors of Qum Seminary, Jamatul Mudarrasin, in 1997, 1997, introduced Khamenei as a qualified first-ranking clerics among seven grand Ayatollahs. There was not the name of Muntaziri, Sistani, and Muhammad Rouhani in that list. This decision was innovative in the Shiite history and illegal according to the regulations of that association itself. This association declared disqualification of Ayatollah Shariat Madari in 1983 because of politi political conflict between the leader and his competitor. In 2009, this association did the same thing about Ayatollah Sani after his criticism during Green Movement. So it means that the decision of this association is not religious, is purely political. Anyway, 
Although Ayatollah Khomeini frankly declared that the condition of the Shiite authority is not required for the leader, Mr. Khamenei violated practically that decree and called himself Shiite authority. According to political qualification of assembly of experts, it is trivialization of the Shiite authority or attaining religious position through the political coupon. How about objections? Did Qum Seminary or other Shiite seminary accept this trivialization or not? This abusing the religious positions and their political power was rejected by a few clerics. Ayatollah Muntaziri advised Mr. Khamenei in his private letter in 1995 to confine himself to the leadership and do not involve in issuing fatwa and claim, claiming Shiite authority that is forbidden for him. He did not listen to his teacher. When he was young, Muntaziri was the teacher and Khamenei was the student. In 1998, Ayatollah Muntaziri criticized Mr. Khamenei because of his claim as first ranking clerics and issuer of fatwa. He frankly expressed publicly that Mr. Khamenei is disqualified for being the Grand Ayatollah as issuer of fatwa and he should stop this trivialization of Shiite authority. And I borrowed the title of my book from the speech of Ayatollah Muntaziri in, in this time, 1998. He added that the advantage and the honor of Shiite clerics in comparison to Sunni seminaries were their independence from the state. No, you are making the seminary as contingent to the state and it's harmful for seminary and for Shiite Islam. According to Ayatollah Muntaziri, the required condition of the leader is being most learned Shiite authority. The second objection. Ayatollah Ahmad Azari Qumi, a conservative second ranking cleric whose booklet of fatwas was banned by the government shifted to the camp of opposition in 1997. He was the founder member of Association of Instructors of Qum Seminary, Jamaat al and its first president. Azari criticized Khamenei and disqualified him for both leadership and Shiite authority explicitly in his open letter to President Khatami in 1998. A few days after publishing this letter, he was house arrested. The two dissident clerics were house arrested without trail. Both of them continued their critique strongly. Azari passed away after 15 months in house arrest. And Muntaziri was released after five years in house arrest in the age of 80. When the physicians warned the governments that he would be died if he was not released immediately. The third objection. Muhammad Hussein Fazlullah in Beirut did not accept Khamenei as Grand Ayatollah. He was under pressure and restriction of pro-Iranian Shiite in Lebanon, that you know they are strong, after his criticism. The fourth one, Abdul Karim Musavi Ardebili, and he was the head of judiciary power in the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, was fired from Tehran Friday prior when he mildly criticized involvement of Khamenei in Shiite authority without mentioning his name. It was his first, it was his last sermon of Friday prayer of Tehran. 
although almost all of the Shiite authorities disagree with the involvement of Khamenei in Shiite authority, means first ranking, but they follow the traditional method of quietist. And they did not express publicly their criticism. The theocratic state could control the clerical disagreement by three methods. First, threatening. Second, bribing. Third, imagination that the authority of the only Shiite ruler in the world is in the interest of Islam in any way. And this third point, I think, is the most important point among Shiite clerics. They ask themselves, okay, if he's not in the first or in the second ranking, but this is the only Shiite ruler in the world, we should follow him or we should support him. And the last part, and maybe the most important part of my presentation, toward future. Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani was the kingmaker in the meeting of the June 4th, 1989, of the Assembly of Experts, by reporting a fake narration from Ayatollah Khomeini about Mr. Khamenei. He thought that Khamenei would be the figurehead of Islamic Republic of Iran. And he, as the president, will be at, will administration will administer the country himself. But Khamenei was a very good political player and after strengthening his position, fired the kingmaker from the head of assembly of experts and did not accept any partnership in his absolute authority. Also, Hashemi Rafsanjani made a very big mistake by sending Khamenei to the power, but he started an important behavior in Islamic Republic of Iran for succeeding the leader. He made an important procedure for it. The leader should have administrative experience more than religious knowledge. <clears throat> so he compared, for example, Ayatollah Gulpaigani as the first ranking and Mr. Khamenei as the third ranking, and he believed that priority belongs to the second, not to the first. We want administration, not religious knowledge. His theory briefly was this minimum religious knowledge with maximum administrative experience. The best candidates of leadership are the clerics that have the experience of presidency or head of judiciary power in their record. I think it's the summary of what happened in Iran. And if we want to think about the future of Iran, we should look at this statement, the last sentence. It means that the new leader of Iran after this of Mr. Khamenei will be among these three. First, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani, the second man in the history of Islamic Republic as the first choice. He always was the second man in the first decade and also after that. It's the first choice of leadership. Second, Mahmoud Hashemi Shahrudi, the former head of judiciary power, as the second choice. Third, Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran, as a third choice. It's obvious that the powerful revolutionary guard commanders do not like these two presidents, not Hashemi, not Rouhani. The future of leadership will, re will remain as a complex case. The title of my presentation was Complexity of Leadership of Iran. Thank you for your patience.
floor is open for your question. Uh, explain about the history of when the term Ayatollah was introduced because you did not go into that. Like, how far back was the first Ayatollah? Who's the first Ayatollah? I mentioned they are not theoretical, they are practical. And the history of in the background of these four titles are not more than one century. It means in the time of in the time of Ahunda Khurasani, it, he was in the time in 1906, in the time of Iranian constitutional movement, he was called Ahund. There is no any title for him. And Ayatollah Burujerdi was his student, and he wrote for him Hujjatul Islam and Muslimin. The people of that time understood his mushtaq. It means these titles were under evolution. The first Ayatollah, it was not also dominated on that time. In uh, seven centuries after immigration, after Hijra, was Ayatollah al He Helli. He became mushtahed when he was so young, about 12, 13 years old. But it was not said for all the people. Or Hujjatul Islam, for the first time, it was used for al Ghazali. So we have these titles, but uh, as a routine title for the Shiite clerics, the history is less than one century. Yes? So my understanding is that even uh, Ahmadi 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 
from all the criticism. So it's a new definition. We do not have this definition in Iranian constitution. Because of it, I think he changed the essence of this assembly of experts. Yes? Um, the concept of life is key. Can you, can you talk about that with regard to, it was many who came up with that idea. And as I understand, in the uh, Shiite theocracy, uh, this is controversial and has been discussed for many, many, maybe hundreds of years. And not all uh, Shiite authorities believe in that. But, but yet, but the initial constitution which was written after the revolution was modified, and this was introduced because Khomeini has come up with this idea. Can you talk about it to the interaction and why? You know? Yes. I wrote at least three books on this issue. <laughs> and I can briefly tell you the concept of guardianship of jurists has at least three levels. In the first level, it's consensus among all Shiites. And this, its domain is something that all jurists should do collectively. Uh, for example, if there is any orphan in our neighborhood, in the city, someone should protect them. If no one do this, it's the duty of jurists. In this level, all Jews believe that it's consensus. The second one is the domain of guardianship of Jews are more than these uh, small issues. It's about political. It's about general guardianship of Jews in public affair, but it's restricted by Sharia, by the ordinance of Sharia. A few of them, not most of them, believe in the second level. So the first jurist that mentioned explicitly his idea about this, it came back to the time of Safavid dynasty about 400 years ago in the name of Muhaqqaq al-Karaki. And after him in the time of Qajar dynasty, a jurist in the name of Muhaqqaq al-Naraqi, Ahmad Naraqi, here for the first time he wrote a chapter, or not, not a chapter, section in his book and used the argument about the guardianship of jurists. But he had only one sentence, not more, about politics. After him, it was expanded. Many jurists deny it, including Sheikh Al-Ansari, that he's the, in the, one of the most distinguished Shiite jurists, after him, Akhund Khurasani, that he has the same position as Ayatollah Khomeini had in Iranian constitution, and he denied absolutely all the political version of Velayat al faqih And he said, we cannot prove it according to these hadith, to these traditions that we have. Ayatollah Khomeini came and believed in the third level, and he believed to the absolute, not general, absolute guardianship of the juries that were appointed by God. By absolute, he means that he had the same authority as prophet and imams had, without any difference. And his decision is not restricted by any religious decrees. It's in contract. Uh, in opposition to the second level, they said that uh, we should restrict it by religious decree. He said if there is any public interest, the interest of Ummah, the interest of the regime, can cancel, is able to cancel at least temporarily the religious decree. So it's something that, like an earthly god, god on the earth. So. If we compare his opinion with the other jurists, I can tell you, after research and a very large research, this idea is in absolute minority among Shiite jurists. It's not only me, Ayatollah Khoi, 
that he was the teacher of Ayatollah Sistani mentioned in one of his books that the majority, the large majority of Shia jurists do not believe in absolute guardianship of jurists. It means this theory that we have in Iran is the representative of an absolute minority of Shia jurists. It's Ayatollah Khomeini and his students, and not all of his students, some of his students, not anyone. Okay, yes. Um, there's been a Iranian uh, political scientist writing in the United States named Ali Afsani. He's written a lot on the revolutionary... Ali? Afsani, I believe. <coughs> oh, Riza. Ali Aslani. Riza Aslani. Maybe it's different. We have Ali Ansari. But so tell me the name of the book. Maybe you can find the adult. Uh, he, wrote, uh, no, he wrote a big, large book on Iran's revolutionary guards. <coughs> They're changing world under President Ahmadinejad. Do you give a lot of credence to his writing? I did not acknowledge the name of the book and the name of the author, both. So I did not read it to tell you that. I do not have any idea, sorry. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you, you talked about um, the uh, uh, charities that are given to the first ranking clerics um, in Iran. Now, can you speak to uh, the uh, sort of the source of funding that goes to the other ranks of the clerics in Iran that allows them to live the lavish lifestyles that they do now and versus uh, the lifestyles that they had when the Shah was in power? We do not have a written regulation for this thing. Not on that time, not in this time. Also, the Shiite authorities, the first ranking, when they collected this religious tax or zakat or homes, it does not mean they use it for personal affairs. It's collected by them. After that, the major expense of this uh, tax, religious tax, is supporting the Shiite seminary. It means they pay uh, the scholarship of the students of seminary. All of, um, I can tell you, maybe 90% of this money come to the uh, scholarship of the students and also the salary of the teachers of seminary. And if the second ranking are teachers, yes, they have some fun as teacher. It depends on the courses that they, they teach or the researches that they do. It's something like this. But I, do, I tell you, told you that we do not have any written regulation about it. They have, they do, they did not write it because in the time of Shah, because of censorship, in the time of after revolution, also they have a lot of restrictions because if the governments know they have some money, they they they, they will make some restrictions for them. Because of it, they are hidden. Yes. Uh, these titles, as I told you, we do not have any written regulation for them. You cannot find any anything in any books. I mentioned in my presentation, they are practical, not theoretical. And in recently, they use Imam for two persons. Firstly, it was used for Musa Sadr in Lebanon. It was before Khomeini. Secondly, it was used for Ayatollah Khomeini. Among Arab Shiites, Imam is not the same. It does not have the same meaning as Iranian use. So it does not mean Imam al masum It does not mean infallible Imams. It means, for example, a very senior person senior Ayatollah. So they use Imam for, for all their clerics, not for only distinguished one. It's in Lebanon or in Iraq. But in Iran on that time, because they use Imam for those 12, it's so difficult for many people to use it for other persons. So also in this time, they try to use Imam for Mr. Khamenei too. I mentioned some of these uh, 
struggles for using this title in the book, especially in Lebanon. Everything started in Lebanon. After that, they immigrated to Iran and they used it. So I do not think there is any uh, fact behind these titles. It's not holy. You can use it, but try to define it as it is, <clears throat> not hide the, uh, those content that you want to do it. Yes? What is going to be the result of the uh, U.S.-Iran nuclear talks and then based on the result of the relationship between the U.S. and Iran? I <laughs> see. I'm a scholar of Islamic studies and a little bit Iranian studies. I'm not a scholar of nuclear issue. I have some knowledge that got from, for example, the media. But it's better not to, for, as a person like me, to talk in these uh, issues because my knowledge is not so high. I hope that we have good end for it. The only thing that I can think. Yes. Knowledge. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, 35 years ago, uh, they came to power, with the power of, by the power of people, my generation. 30, and the, but the remaining power by the power of God. Any thought about what this generation and future generation will think of these, all these ranking that you mentioned? So, also, I was. I, I think I'm not so far from your generation. <laughs> I lived on that time. We heard something on that time. I think they are not new. So Hujatul Islam or Ayatollah or Ayatollah or Osma. But they were not so clear for us. And those conditions that I made in this presentation, I think they made it somehow clear that when we want to use it for a person, we should be careful. Did he polish anything? Did he teach any courses? Did he publish, for example, a booklet? After that, if he claimed, I am the grand Ayatollah, say, who are you? You did not teach anything. You did not publish. You did not have any permission, any certificate. How can you call yourself grand Ayatollah? So it's, I think, the only thing that I can tell you. We should know this regulation and spread this regulation and use these. I do a very good point. About two months ago, in the site of Mr. Sistani in Najaf, he deleted the title of Ayatollah for, for himself. It was the first time in English version and also in Arabic and in Persian version. I think it's a very good thing that because a lot of challenging points about using these titles, and we learned a lesson from him because and another uh, first ranking cleric uh, in Qum, Mr. Wahid Khurasani. He mentioned about six months ago, seven months ago, and because of the importance of his speech, I made the third edition of my book. So, in this book, also it was an e-book, uh, it's the third edition of it. And the third edition, because of <coughs> adding this point that he made, he said that no, we have a time that a person at one, at one night become Hujjatul Islam Muslim. In the second night, he become Ayatollah. And in the third night, he become Ayatollah al -Uzma. He did not mention any name, but it was so obvious that what, is, what, what was he saying? So, after that, Ayatollah Sistani in Najaf, he deleted all titles. He said, and in his go tonight, search his website, see, it's Hazrat Aqa Sistani. Without any, not Ayatollah, not Ayatollah Uzma, not anything. After him, also, I followed him, mentioned in my articles, from now I will not use none of these titles for anyone. Also in my presentation, I did not use uh, these titles, not for my teacher, Mr. Montazeri, not for uh, Mr. Khomeini, not for the others. I think it's better for us to call their names. If they have some reality, we can say they're in the first ranking, second ranking, third ranking, there are these conditions, and we do not play with the titles. So we do, it's not the same as academy that you have this certificate 
of PhD, after that they can call you doctor. And if you do not have this certificate, it's forbidden to say to call you doctor. But among in the Shiite seminaries, we do not have these certificates. They are rare, so few. Because of it, it's so open to make these controversial points that I made. So I think it's the best thing for all of us. Do not use any title for anyone, including me. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. I have two questions. Yes. One is, um, suppose that the leadership of the Islamic Republic had followed the... Order of the suppose they had followed all the regulations to use the correct titles as your suggestions from your list. Do you think it would make any difference in the characteristics of the regime and how would it be different if they had really followed the letter of the law or, or the so my point is not using the titles. In the book also I did I I try to only distinguish between these rankings. Because of it I mentioned first ranking, second ranking, third ranking, fourth ranking. I did not use and I do not believe in any titles at all. And I myself believe in secular state. I do not believe in any kind of theocratic state. But for those who believe in Islamic State, they should follow their regulation. It's not correct. When they say, we have grand idol laws, we have idol laws, we have mushtahid, we have these certificates, after that, at one night, without any promotion, because of political pressure, they made these things. It's wrong. It's what is my point. So it means that according to official opinion in Iran, I criticize it in this book. And also in my first book about Velayat al-Faqih, about guardianship of juries, at the introduction I wrote, I am writing this book according to the official knowledge in Shiite seminary. In many of these points, I do not believe in them. I criticize this. But if you want to follow it, these are my critics. And I think it's completely scientific and academic. It was your first, yes. My second question is, at the beginning of your presentation, you had a slide, a slide that mentioned the duty of protecting the Islamic community in, yes. in, in, as one of the duties of the leader. And I'm wondering, um, I've been wondering in terms of um, the role of the grand ayatollahs that exist today, to what extent are they really able to protect the Islamic community, the, the Muslims in the world? I mean, with everything that is happening in the Middle East right now, I keep wondering, you know, is there anything that these grand ayatollahs or, you know, uh, religious figures can do to protect people? And it seems that there is nothing that we can do. So, they, their ability, or their ability is limited, we know. Like the other abilities, their power is not absolute and infinite. So they are uh, limited power. I think if we compare what is happening in Syria and Iraq and what happened in Iran, so there are somehow some similarities and a lot of differences. It's good to compare these uh, events to each other. So we have a radicalism, Sunni radicalism in ISIS or Daesh, as Iranian said it. And also we have some kind of radicalism in Iran. But Shiite radicalism, because under uh, protection of these grand ayatollahs, and they have some more knowledge that the heads of this, for example, uh, radical Sunnis in some like Al Qaeda, like Boko Haram, like the ISIS. So you know the uh, head of many of these uh, these groups were not educated persons. They were engineers. So Bin Laden was an engineer. He was not, uh, for example, Muslim scholar. And 
we hear something about some, some education of them, but they are not complete education. This person in the name of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi that I mentioned his name, it was said that he was graduated from a faculty of Sharia from Baghdad University. Also, he's not educated from any seminaries, so he's not qualified by Shiites, but by Sunni seminaries too. He's not Shiite, he's Sunni. So it means that it's, there is a, some lack of edu knowledge, Islamic knowledge for these persons. And because of it, they made a lot of big mistakes. I mentioned only one mistake that is common around, among all of these uh, groups. They generalized something that happened in 14 centuries ago out of their con context. If, for example, in the ninth chapter of the Quran, Surah of the Quran, it was said something about pagans of Medina or Jews of Medina on that time that they did not follow their promises, their contracted to profit. And it was said you should fight with them. And no, they. Uh, make it absolute, make it con concrete from its context, and said, you should fight with all non-Muslims. We do not have this verse in the Quran. We have something about fighting about pagans, and about the Jews that were in Medina, not all Jews. And they generalized, you should fight against all non-Muslims. Who said this? Which prophet said this? I think it's because of lack of knowledge that we have among these radicalist Muslim. And you know, they were, they were denied by maybe consensus of majority of Muslim scholars, Sunni, and because they're not Shiite, so we did not hear anything from Shiite scholars because they know it's wrong. They do not need to say anything. It's the time that Sunni scholars said something against them. If a Shiite, made this, for example, crime, after that we should expect from this Grand Ayatollah, why, did you, why didn't you say anything against them? It's, I think, because of it. I was asked in one interview, it's the time of Boko Haram, about, for example, several months ago, why didn't you, these Grand Ayatollahs say anything? So it's not their job. They do not agree with them from the root. Because of it, I do not, it's a good expectation from them. Also, I agree with you, their power, authority is so limited. Yes, uh, How does the Revolutionary Guard fit into this whole complexity of the leadership in Iran? Can you comment on that a little bit? Where is their power and, and how proper are they and is their power to switch ship? Yeah. I mentioned my knowledge about it. But there are, there are a lot of ambiguity here. Uh, I can tell you the theories, the theories of Shiite seminary, Shiite scholars. But you know, the logic of the arm, army is not some theoretical thing. The logic is in the weapon. And you know better than the logic of the weapon, what is it? So something that is good until now in Iran, we didn't have at least after the revolution, we didn't have any co exactly independently by the <coughs> Revolutionary Guard. If it's something happened, for example, against Green Movement, it was supported by the leader and his men. So I'm not sure that they have the power without the leader or not. It's ambiguous for me too. And after him, what will be happen? I do, I do not know. I mentioned only those things that somehow they are clear for me. And I mentioned it's ambiguous, it's complex. And in Iran, you know, no one can expect anything about Iran. In any election, we have something new. In all of these elections that I remember, so Iran is the land of complexity. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, does uh, Ahmadinejad have any religious training that would allow him to rise in this part of the leadership structure? No. Ahmadinejad was like a player, that the director was someone else. And the director 
made this scenario for him come to the same for eight years he came and after that you did not we did not hear anything from him after that and he does not have any root any origin among Iranians it's not about for example these clergy have a lot of background but he I think he followed the orders of the leader above him nothing else you said so, please. Yes. What are the differences between Montazeri's interpretation of the Balayat-Fahri and Khomeini's interpretation? Montazeri? Yeah. Ayatollah Montazeri had uh, three different uh, ideas about Balayat-Fahri in his evolution. So firstly, he believed the same as his master, Ayatollah Khomeini. After that, in 1984, he believed in elected, limited uh, guardianship of jurists. Means, in two points, he disagreed with his master. First, in appointees, he believed the leader should be elective, not appointed by God. Secondly, he did not believe in absolute guardianship. He believed in limited, and this limitation came from the Constitution. So it's his second. Thirdly, in 1999, on that his historical speech in criticism of Mr. Khamenei, he made this point, and I think he criticized himself too. He said that the main job of Wali al-Faqi, or the guardianship of juries, is not executive affair. is monitoring the bills of the parliament, nothing more. And I told him, he, when he was alive, it's the end of Velayat al-Faqih, it's the end of guardianship of jurists. Because the meaning of Velayat al-Faqih is executive power of him. When you say he should not do anything in this case, it's the job of the president, and his job is only mon monitoring the bills of the parliament, with al-Nazara, al-Majlis, al for example, Shura. It means that it's the end of the theory of Velayat al-Faqih. And I'm so, I was so happy when he said this, and I wrote also then to him that you criticize and you get two pillars of the theory of Velayat al-Faqih, and I break two other uh, pillars of this, and it has only four, so there is no pillar for it until now. Okay. Yes, for the second time. So, so you spoke about the limitation of the power and authority of the Grand Ayatollahs in, in response to the question of it. I'm trying to understand what evidence can you cite of their power where they have actually been effective in shaping events uh, in whether it is in Iran or, or power of who? The Grand Ayatollahs. The highest ranking the highest ranking if, if you spoke about the limitation of their power, what examples can you give us of where they have had influence? For example the, the killings between the Sunnis and the Shias in in Iraq even before the Islamic State. Uh, that certainly was going on rampantly, and, and there seemed to be nobody in power to control the, the killing and the animosity between these two sects. I'm not in Iraq. I hear something or, or read something, the same as you, but the role of Mr. Sistani there in Iraq, so, I think, brilliant there in Iraq. And he tried to restrict this violence there. So he issued some fatwa that for all Shiites, his followers, if anyone so made something insult you and your beliefs, you are not allowed religiously to do anything. It's forbidden completely. So I think it's good. It's what we need. It's, it it, it's not the duty of him to work. He should issue this fatwa. He, this fatwa, it depends on the followers. If some of them did not follow him, it's not fault of him. It's fault of the people. So we cannot guarantee. He is not, for example, he can also issue this fatwa, nothing more. We, I do not have expect more than this. Maybe, maybe you can criticize Nuri Maliki, the prime minister of Iraq. Why did he do this job to we have this problem after him? It's correct. Or maybe 
So I think a uh, huge expectation of the Grand Ayatollahs are not so correct. We should develop the rate ratio of the culture of the Muslim countries. And because, because of the lack of some development in some Muslim countries, we have a lot of problems. As you see, for example, in Pakistan, we have a lot of Shiite-Sunni conflicts more than the other countries. We do not have this problem the same or in this level in Iran. Because a little bit, for example, the rate of development is higher than, than Pakistan about sectarian, for example, conflicts. Or in Afghanistan, we have this problem because of the rate of development. So what, should, what we should do is promotion of the development. If we, can, if we do this, after that, most of these problems will be resolved. It's my opinion. Yes. Uh, my information and understanding of Islam and Quran is very limited at best. So I have a general question. Uh, just listening to the presentation, it strikes me, one can argue that we're talking about much of you about how these are all regulations that you said that are not being adhered to. So what? My point being is that as a as scholar, can you tell me why is it that the word of God in Quran supposedly is open to so much interpretation that runs the gamut among amongst not only scholars, but these men of God supposedly the jockey in position of power are narcissistic at best. And it's just at such a haphazard place. So what are these regulations along the gamut? My question is. As a scholar, can you please tell me any of these things have they been explicitly pointed in the Quran? If not, why why is it that it's open so so much interpretation so people's lives, like you said, these conflicts get just, you know, affected by such a drastic way through centuries? It's a big expectation. If it was all of it, it was in the Quran, we have different interpretation. It's the nature of all texts. When we have some textual fact, it's open to different interpretation. It's humanistic understanding of the text. We should not expect that we should not have any differences or any conflict. The good expectation is this. We should have peaceful uh, My apology for follow-up. It begs the question in the first place, why do you go to so much criticism on something that is open to so much interpretation in the first place? If it's supposed to be because it's humanistic. Human because humanistic. If you go, for example, in non-religious texts, in non-religious humanities, we do not have differences. For example, psychology, sociology, law, not religious so law. We have a lot of differences. Science is not says the word of God. It got it, you know, otherwise, it is so autocratic. This way, right. the rest of the world, science in the realm of science, you have hypotheses. You go about science debate. Religion is not in the realm of science to prove or disprove. No, my it's point. Based on faith and interpretation. My point is, humanities are open to different interpretations, regardless the religious or non-religious. So it's the humanities you're talking about? Humanities, yes. Including, so religious science, religious knowledge, religious studies is a branch of humanities. Because of humanities, it's open to different interpretation. It's not the fault of anyone. We should try to make some order or find the order of this interpretation. And I think if we believe tolerance in these different interpretations, all the problems will be solved. Thank you. Thank you.